So I first of all want to thank members of our community chat, uh, Grant and Jonah, because the questions and some of the suggestions that they had are really what informed this episode. Because the question that we're going here, uh, that we're going to be going through today is how is a boy supposed to grow up to be a good man when there's no father to show them how to do it? And this is an issue which has become an, an increasingly um, significant problem within not just the United States, but across the world. Um, but the United States specifically is unfortunately leading the way in this category. And it's having disastrous effects right now within our society, and it's only going to get worse if we don't figure out a way to correct this issue, but to also provide assistance, to provide help for boys that are going up without a father who want to be good men, and a lot of the single moms out there that are doing their best in order to try to raise them. And so today, we're going to be sharing some personal experiences on this. We're going to be looking at some data, and we're hopefully going to be providing both some answers um, to how we get out of this mess, how do we help the people that are currently in it, um, and also providing a little hope for both the roles that men and women, husbands and wives, fathers and mothers play in ensuring that boys grow up to be good men. And that's what's going to be the focus today. So once again, thank you very much to Grant. Thank you very much to Jonam for the suggestions and their insight into this topic. And we hope you do it justice on this episode of Making the Argument, brought to you by Good Ranchers. As Nick said, this episode idea came directly from our community chat, and we would love to have you join if you haven't already. You can do that by going to the link in the description, clicking that button, signing up. We'd love to get to know you there. Once you join, make sure you go to the Introduce Yourself tab and let us know who you are. All right. As always, I'm your host, Nick Freitas, member of the Virginia House of Delegates, but other than that, a reasonably good guy. Not with us today is my beautiful bride, Tina, which is unfortunate because I really wanted to get her take on this, but we're actually uh, having to... Uh, Settle some issues right now, and Tina's doing a great job taking care of that while I, so I can be here on the show. Um, we have our political prognosticator, our resident historian, and our benevolent warlord in training, Christian Hines. How are you doing, Christian? Um, I'm doing okay. This is uh, going to be a pretty personal topic. It's going it's to be a weighty episode for a lot of us, actually. And then, of course, we have our producer of producers, the good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited. All right, so let's get into it. Um, first things first, we're going to kind of share some personal experiences. I want to make one thing clear right off the bat. Um, for those of you who don't know, and I, I think anybody that's been watching for a while has probably heard me mention it either on, on uh, you know, Reels or, or YouTube Shorts, but also a little bit on the podcast. My parents got divorced uh, when I was three. Um, we actually kind of went through two divorces when I was growing up. But I want to make something really clear here. Um, my dad... Uh, lived in Southern California. I, I spent the school years in Northern California, spent the summers with my dad. Uh, my dad would come up and, and uh, spend time on holidays. He'd spend time for major events and things like that. So I, I, I want to make something really clear off the bat. Even though it, it wasn't what I think any of us would call an ideal situation, and I think if you ask my mother and my father, they would agree it was an ideal situation, um, I was very blessed uh, to have both a mother and a father that were uh, very in invested in their kids, despite the fact that their marriage didn't last. And the, the reason why I want to point that out is both to give tribute to my, both my mother and my father for, uh, you know, making the best of a bad situation um, and, and really going through some Herculean efforts to make sure that they could be, you know, good, good uh, parents, but also hope for people that are out there that maybe think that if, they can't raise their kids in an ideal situation that, you know, where, where do you go from here? Is there, is there any real hope? And the answer is there is, there is, it isn't ideal. And I, and I'm not, and I'm not going to sugarcoat that. And we're going to look at a lot of, we're going to look at a lot of facts and figures and evidence to demonstrate that um, it's not easy. And I don't think this is the way it was meant to be done. Um, there's a lot of people out there and it's become very, um, I don't know, like a mainstay of popular culture to act as if children don't need both a mother and a father. And yes, I mean a biological mother and a biological father. None of the crazy gender swapping, you know, identity choose whatever you feel like today. I, no, that doesn't get it done. Uh, they need a they need a mother and they need a father. And we're going to discuss some of the reasons why on this episode. But uh, my own personal experience was mom and dad got divorced when I was three. It was me and my uh, younger brother at that time. He's about three and a half years younger than me. Uh, dad was a police officer with the LAPD. Mom was a, a nurse in, in Northern California. So um, I largely grew up, both me and my brother, uh, for, for most of our lives, grew up 
spending the school year with my, our mom and then the summers with my dad. And then later on when my uh, younger brother was going to high school, uh, he opted to go down and live with my dad in the school years. And then he would come up for the summer. So we, we kind of, we kind of swap roles there for a, a few years. Um, one of the things that, you know, that had an impact on is that obviously there was, there was a lot of things my dad couldn't be there for. And it, it's not like he didn't try. He, he really did. And like I said, uh, one of the things that was uh, a real blessing in, in my upbringing was that my mom and my dad largely had each other's backs when it came to disciplinary issues with me. Um, when it came to, if they had a disagreement, I never felt like I was being used as a pawn in their disagreements. And I, I thought that was, you know, again, a very mature way to handle and an, an less than ideal situation. Um, but what it, what it meant for my mother is that there was a, a lot of times where, you know, I needed a father figure there and, and she couldn't be there. She couldn't be the father figure. Um, but I really think she did an, an excellent job fulfilling what I would say are, are still the responsibilities that the mother has in developing what a young man should be. And this is something I don't think gets talked about a lot right now because there's, there's been such a, a deficit of fathers in the picture. And sometimes that father's not in the picture because the father is just a dirtbag. Other times the father's not in the picture as much as they would like to be because our court system is in many cases arrayed against them. And because you do have, sometimes you have mothers that will utilize that court system and use their kids as pawns. Um, and, it, and it's, and it's horrible. <laughs> It's absolutely horrible when, when you have a father that desperately wants to be involved in their kids' lives and the mother sees, um, just sees this as an opportunity to get back at them or get money or whatever else it is. And I'm not going to pretend that doesn't happen because I know what happens. Um, it didn't happen in my situation, but I've seen it happen in others. So I, I want to acknowledge that sometimes it is the father that's just a deadbeat and sometimes it's the mother that uses her children as, as pawns in a battle she's fighting with, with her ex. And, um, and both of those situations are horrible. Um, the other thing that I, I want to point out here is um, when you're in that situation uh, and, and the mother and father can act civilly with one another and have their backs. And, and I have a, a specific story I want to mention here. And this is when my, my mother got remarried um, and he got, she got remarried. I think I was around, I think I was around eight or nine years old. Um, and that marriage lasted about, f about four and a half years. And then they got divorced. And as they were going through the divorce, uh, my stepfather at that time, who was, who was not a, not a horrible guy. I, I don't, I don't want to say anything like that. I think there was, there was a lot of times where he was doing his best, but it was what it was. I, I was not disappointed when I found out they were going to get a divorce, but it wasn't because he was abusive or mean or anything like that to, to me or my brother or, or my mother. But, um, there was this time where at that point, um, as they were going through the divorce, he was still trying to be involved in our lives, which, you know, I, I guess is, is respectable. Um, but it, it kind of came to a point where it was a little, it was manipulative. It was manipulative where he was trying to use us to convince my mom to stay with him. And, um, he asked to speak with my father and my father came up from Southern California. It was about 500 miles uh, to sit with him. And he laid out his whole case to my dad and my dad made it very clear, um, to him that that's all fine and good, but I don't care. Um, she's the mother of my children and what she says will go and I will back her move. And I thought that was very important. Another thing that happened that was, I think really um, had a huge impact on me growing up is that I had the benefit of living in close proximity to both my uh, maternal and paternal grandparents and um, loved and respected uh, both sets of grandparents very much. I'm, I'm very blessed that my, my um, grandmother on my mother's side is, is still alive and just absolute wonderful woman. Um, my mom's dad passed away a while back. Uh, we referred to him as Papa John. Uh, he was great. Uh, he, again, he, he got to fill part of that role um, and part of that father figure and that positive male role model when I was growing up. And then my uh, dad's dad, who we called, you know, Papa Bill, <laughs> um, absolute, you know, wonderful human being. He, he was kind of that, that quintessential, um, you know, grandpa that you, that you see that, you know, you go to the lodge and have coffee with grandpa and all of his friends and they tell war stories from World War II. And, you know, you go into the den and, and he would tell me about being a sailor and being a firefighter and, um, 
you know, that's where I, I learned how to, you know, take apart guns and whatnot. <laughs> um, you know, I would, I would go in there and, uh, they had this fun game where, uh, we'd take an old Colt 1911 and, uh, you know, once I got pretty good at assembling and disassembling it, I'd had to put the blindfold on and then he'd throw out pieces from other pistols, uh, to try to trip me up. And some people look at that now and think that's, that's crazy. Uh, I have really fond memories of being able to spend that time with grandpa and, and grandma and, and, and um, we would go there and, and Papa Bill and I would, would watch John Wayne movies together. And I remember when I left for the army, uh, this was back in the days where you, you'd still have the VHS tape and you'd record off the TV and whatever, there was a John Wayne series. So I still have some old VHS tapes uh, with really, really blurry, horrible audio, <laughs> John Wayne movies with a bunch of soap commercials in between um, that, that he sent me. And I, and I held on to him just for that reason. So, um, I say all of this just to give a, a little bit of a background of what growing up was like for me. And, uh, and I, and I, I know there's a lot of people that had it and much more difficult than I did. Uh, one of the things that is going to be a recurring theme, I think throughout this whole episode that I want to point out though, is that one of the greatest gifts that, uh, the, the men and the women in my life growing up gave to me was, the fact that at no point um, would they have ever accepted this idea that, oh, well, you're growing up in a, in a broken home. So if you act out or if you do this, if it, well, well, clearly that's just because of it. No, no, they insisted that I, I act with honor and integrity and honesty and mom and dad being split up or dad not being there at times or, or mom not being there. At times, that was not an excuse uh, for, for me to not succeed, for me to not to strive for things, for me to, you know, not, you know, act out or not behave well. And, um, that is one of the greatest gifts they gave for me is not never allowing me to look at those situations as a crutch, which could excuse poor and self-destructive behavior. Um, and I am, I cannot even tell you how, how grateful, um, uh, I am for that. So that, that's a little background from, from my side, um, you want to go into, <laughs> I mean, it won't be as long. I also yeah. grew up in a divorced household. My, my parents got divorced when I was like one. Um, so I, I have no memory of them being together. Um, I certainly do have memories of them interacting with each other though, because they did not at all get along for the longest time. My childhood was a back and forth struggle between the two of them. And I was a, a battlefield in in one of many battlefields, it's, it's gotten a lot better since I became an adult. Um, and, and now I would say that I don't think that there's actually any animosity between the two of them now because so much time has passed. It's, you know, it's been almost 30 years, but, um, I mean, I remember as a kid, you know, travel, I remember, you know, traveling in the car, you know, back and forth between them because my dad would get me on holidays and my mother got me the rest of the year. Um, and, you know, sitting in the car on, what is it, like I-10 in Louisiana. <laughs> that By the way, Monroe, Louisiana smells like trash. There's a giant <laughs> landfill right off the highway, and we would have to pass through it yeah. at, because my, my father lived in uh, Tyler, Texas, and my mother lived in Alabama at the time. And um, and so we would pass through this this town at Monroe, Louisiana. It's, I just remember it smelled terrible. That was, that was a memory that I had as a kid. But... Um, I, I will say that there, you know, at the time, I didn't necessarily think anything of it. Uh -huh. I thought this was normal. And what I find so fascinating is you showed me this this graph here, and I know that I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I, I want to bring this up at least insofar as explaining my story, and I know that we're going to get to it at some point. Nick, Nick showed me this graph, and I'm going to try to describe it for our audio listeners. He showed me this graph like, five minutes before we started recording. And this really caught my eye because I did not know this was the case. This is from Pew Research. This is just a few years ago. And it says almost a quarter of U.S. children live in single parent homes more than any other country. And and then it shows a map of the entire world. And if Hamilton, if you could just scroll down just a little bit sure. to actually show the map um, for our, our listeners on YouTube, just a little bit more. There you go. Here's the map of the world. And for our audio listeners, what you see is the West, with with a couple exceptions, Russia being one and Sub-Saharan Africa being another one, and we 
we think we know why Sub-Saharan Africa has a, a high number of single parent homes. And it's probably not for the same reason as the West. But when you look at the West plus Russia, with just a few exceptions like Poland and stuff like that, the number of single parent homes is significantly higher than when you look at like either the Islamic world or Southeast Asia or East Asia. Um, and shockingly, the U.S. leads the entire world, entire world in terms of single parent homes, almost 25 percent, 23 percent. So almost a quarter yeah. of all homes are single parent homes. And so growing up, the reason I bring this up now is because growing up as a kid, I thought that was normal. Like I, I knew that a lot of other people had a lot of people had, you know, uh, uh, you know, their, their, their mother and father in the home with them. And I never got to, uh, to enjoy that, at least on the biological side. I'll get to this in a minute. I did have, I, I did get to enjoy two fantastic step parents that are still around and, and still with my mother and father. But I remember growing up and just thinking, oh, it's just normal. And then I, I, I now see this and I look at the rest of the world and I'm like, actually, this is very abnormal. The, the U.S. is leading the entire world when it comes to, to this problem, higher when, than any other country. When, and to give everyone an, an idea, especially, again, our, our audio li listeners here, when the, it says the U.S. is 23 percent, that, that's kids growing up in a, in a single parent home. Just keep in mind when you start looking at the figures, <clears throat> when you go beyond single parent and you realize the number of kids that are growing up in homes without a mother and father, right, or without their biological mother and father, that number goes up significantly higher. But 23% growing up a single family. The, the next is the UK at 21%. Then By the way, that's where Jonam is from, who, yeah. who was one of the people that pitched this idea to us in our circle chat. And, yeah, and they're the second highest. Yeah, so, the, so the US is 20, US tops it at 23%. Then it's the UK at 21%. Russia at 18%. Denmark at 17%. Uh, France and Kenya are tied for 16%. Ireland or uh, say Tom and say Prince is at 19%. Ireland at fourteen percent, Germany at twelve percent, um, and then it kind of goes. It kind of goes off. And did and, you say Russia? 18, yeah, 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 Russia at eighteen percent. So, yeah, the the top three are the United States, then the UK, and then Russia. Um, and so, Denmark is a close is a close clo fourth. close. Yeah, yeah, very very close fourth. Um, so that's where it's at. Then you look at countries around the world: uh, India five percent, you know, Vietnam four percent, Japan seven percent. Um, you, you look at places in sub-Saharan Africa where, where it's a little bit higher, Uganda 10%, Kenya 16%, uh, and, and, and some of the other ones. But places like the DRC have, have, experienced, have lost millions of people to war and conflict o over the last 10 years. Um, so you, you have a lot of single households there, not, not because... You know, not because of irreconcilable differences in a divorce court, but because somebody got murdered, right? Somebody got killed. Um, but when you look at places like the United States, when you look at places like the UK, Ireland, Germany, France, Denmark, and, and largely Russia, because this is before, you know, even the war there. Um, no, this, this was just, this was irreconcilable differences, right? This, this is now I, I'm sure, I'm sure some of those divorces were as a result of abuse and things of that nature. And, I, and I'm not, you know, I, I understand that there's, there's a number of reasons why this happens, but I have a hard time believing that the United States just has a much higher abuse rate than the rest of the world. I think this is fueled by cultural shifts and attitudes with respect to sex, with respect to relationships, with respect to the importance of husbands and fathers in the household, with respect to a court system and a, and a, um, and a welfare state that essentially pays women to have children out of wedlock. And, I, and every time I say that, people get mad. Sorry. When it stops being true, I'll stop saying it. There you go. Let's go ahead and look at, uh, let's, let's take in the numbers a little bit more on the U.S. Um, next one. Here's the other thing that's, that's fascinating about this is that this is a, this is a fairly recent phenomenon, um, at least in the United States. I, I don't, we didn't bring up numbers for the rest of the world, but if you, if you look at what it was in 1950, um, I, I mean, fairly, this, this, just wasn't a, this just wasn't the problem that it is right now. And then all of a sudden, what do you see is that starting in the 1960s, you start to see a significant trim upward. And then from the 70s, it just goes, it explodes, just goes nuts. And it pretty much continues along that line until the 2010s. And then it finally starts to reverse for a, a, about a decade. You start to have, you start to have about eight years of the numbers starting to gradually slow, and now it's shot up again post-2020. 
Um, and, and it's continuing to climb. It's leveled out a little bit, but it's, it's continuing to climb. Um, let's look at the next graph. All right, this is the non-maritable birth rates. If we can zoom in on this a little bit. This goes all the way back to, to 1940. And um, some of the numbers here, like the, the first three numbers they have are the national average, uh, the white average, and then the non-white average. That's how they carry those statistics from 1940 roughly to 1970. And what you see is that the numbers for everybody, for everybody was under 20%, under 20% all the way up to 1950. So when it came to um, the national average was under 5% all the way to 1950. 5% to 1950. And then you saw like a, a, a gradual uptick. It, it barely crosses over 5% once you get to 1960. And then what do you see? Across all demographics, across all demographics, you start to see a steady increase from 1960 onwards, 1970 being the worst. And then when you break this down a little bit more, here's what you get into. Non-marital birth rates, non-marital birth rates. Okay. The, the, National average right now in the United States post 2010, all right, this is by like 2000, these numbers stop at about 2015, I think, uh, 40% is the national average, okay? For Asians, it's under 20%. For non-Latino white, it's under, it's right at about 30%. For Latino, it's right just under 50%. For Native American, it's about 65%. And for black, it's 70%. Those are the, those are the children being, you know, non, being born out of wedlock. Being born out of wedlock. And 50 years ago, I mean, to, to give you an idea, like, like 50 years ago for, for black, it was 35%, which is still high. But that's where it currently is at for whites. Yeah. So in, in one, less than one lifetime... We, I mean, especially within the black community, it's, I mean, it's doubled. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's more than two thirds now. And, and again, in 1970, the black number was where white is right now. Yeah. And, and so we, we, we have this, we have this issue across the board where everyone is being adversely affected by it. Like everyone today is worse off. It, it, let me put it this way. Asians have the, the, um, the lowest number of, of birth rates outside of marriage in the United States, and they are still over double what the national average was in the 1940s and 1950s. I've always joked that I need to I need to get myself a Japanese wife, <laughs> complete the Axis powers. Oh my the, gosh! The, the, the joke there is that I'm German and Italian. <laughs> no, jeez. <laughs> Worst joke ever. All right. <laughs> So the, the point is, is the, here's the question we have to ask, right? Because so much of what we hear now is that this is a result of poverty. This is a result of, um, for some, they say the result of slavery, the result of, uh, or, or the legacy of slavery. For some, they'll, they'll claim it's uh, anti-immigration you know, sentiment, w whatever it's it was. none of those. Here's what I'll say. If, if, you want, if you want to do a deep dive on this, because we're not doing a deep dive today on this, but if you really want to, Thomas Sowell does some excellent work on this. But, but the question that you have to ask yourselves. And the, and the, the question Thomas soul always asked when he looks at this is like, so you're telling me America is more racist today than it was in 1940. I mean, in 1940, we still had forced segregation and Jim Crow laws. So no, something changed in the sixties and seventies. And it wasn't because the country got more racist or it wasn't because the country got more impoverished and impoverished. No, it, attitudes about sex changed significantly in the 1960s and 70s. Attitudes about marriage changed significantly in the 1960s and 70s. And not only that, but government policy changed significantly in the 1960s and 70s. I, I once brought this up. I once brought up some of the cultural changes that happened in the 1960s. And guess what I got called? A oh, racist. You're a racist. You're saying that the civil right... No, I... <laughs> I, I don't I don't think the country becoming less racist was a problem. I think that was a good thing. I think the problem was is when the government decided to step in and say that if you have children out of wedlock, we're going to subsidize that. So if, if you get if you get if you have a child within marriage, you're gonna make less money than if the husband leaves. I think that was a problem. I think that's a perverse incentive structure. I think when we had a, a culture that uh, especially this this the new wave of feminism that started coming about and, and gaining in prominence in the 1960s and 70s, which was in, you know very very um, had a negative viewpoint toward 
traditional marriage and traditional gender roles, I think that had an impact. I think when you had the widespread use of, of birth control, and again, some people, oh, so you're saying there shouldn't be birth control. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm saying that I think some of these things coincide with, with the results that we've seen. And, and we know that hormonal birth control doesn't just affect whether or not you get pregnant. There, there's other psychological impacts and health impacts associated with That was with in that. the early 70s, right? Like 71. Yeah. Or, or, so like when you look at this chart, and again, for our audio listeners, like the explosion that you see in in divorce rates and the explosion that you see in in non marital uh, birth rates yeah. and the ex- like 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 all of that stuff no is, fault divorce like all yeah. of that stuff okay f- first off for the mo racism crowd you don't see the the, the explosion like post civil rights act you see the explosion post 1970 yeah several years after the yeah. civil rights movement and so then you have to ask yourself gee what what happened in the early 70s well there's two things that are really unpopular to say, but you know, part of the reason that we're in this problem is because you get you get canceled or you get attacked for saying things that are objectively true. There's two things that happened in the early 1970s that perfectly co- align with this. And you can say all day long, correlation is not causation, but I would ask those people, okay, then tell me what the real reason is. And the two things are the introduction of the, of the birth control pill and Roe v. Wade. Abortion on demand. Those Roe are the two Wade. things. And, and a completely different view with respect to the purpose of, of sex. Well, th- it, those, it, those are, it, yeah. it's like culture. It's like politics is downstream from culture, right? Yes. So the introduction of laws that, that enable and make it easier to obtain abortions yeah. follow a cultural shift that demands such things. Yeah. And, and, and when we're telling, and when we're telling men that they're the problem, um, at the same time, they, so you're, 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 you've, you've created this system where you're telling women that if you don't want to keep the child, you don't have to, but you're telling the man that if you do keep the child, well, then you're going to be on the hook for child support for 18 years. And you just need to accept that. And whenever you create these logical inconsistencies within the law, it creates problems with the way that people respond to the law. And, and, and it's, it's no, look, it shouldn't be a shock to anybody when Dave Chappelle gets up on stage and says, if you can kill the mother, mm, then I can abandon them. Your body, your choice, my wallet, my choice. And people look at that and they're horrified. I'm like, you're right. You should be horrified, but you should be horrified that he's being intellectually consistent. And that's part of the problem is that like all this, all these issues that came apart that at the same time, you also see the rise of postmodernism. You see the rise of, of other theories that start to take a hold in academia that start to affect certain aspects of culture before it finally trickles down and we start to see the larger impact. And now they're trying to explain the problems with policies that they, that they advocated for. They're trying to come up with a different reason. Oh, it's the legacy of slavery. Oh, it's just racism. Oh, it's sexism. Oh, it's toxic masculinity. Oh, Oh, it's, could it be that you spent two decades destroying certain aspects? Now, I'm, I'm not saying that everything happened during this time was a bad thing. Not, not at all. Do, do not confuse what I'm saying. But the attack that took place on traditional families, the, te- the attacks that took place, or, or the, the elevating of promiscuity and abortion and sex without consequence and the government replacing the role of fathers in the home, you're telling me that had no adverse impact on the on what we're seeing today. If you're telling me that, I don't believe you. I don't believe you because people operate off of incentives. And when you create bad incentives as a matter of law and as a matter of cultural norms, don't be surprised when you get horrible results. Let's get something out of the way right now for the, the Mo racism crowd. You're telling me that the legacy of slavery had a 100 year delayed effect mm-hmm. on black non maritable birth rates uh-huh. right because look at this chart here under 20% yep. in the 1940s last i checked there wasn't slavery in the 1940s so it wasn't until 100 years after the 13th amendment in the 1960s that you start seeing an explosion of non marital birth rates within within black America. Yeah, that's, 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 well, and, and, and again, that's the, some cope right there. The, the problem is, is that it's across the board. Uh, well, no, but I'm bringing yeah. up, I'm bringing up one example after another. So this idea that this is a le- legacy of slavery or this is because of racism. Oh, if, if it's because of racism, then why haven't we seen whites yeah. follow Asians? Asians haven't gone anywhere, effectively nowhere when it comes to non-maritable birth rates. Whites are where blacks were at 
50 years ago on this. So well, they're apparently doing a really terrible job in imposing racism on other people when when the 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 crisis of non-maritable birth rates are affecting every demographic in this country except for Asians. And you know what? That actually tells us something right there. Because Nick, you and I were actually talking um I think a day or two ago. And and um we were talking about another another episode idea that maybe at some point we'll do and it was about like western culture and what does that mean and and what makes it great and and you know western civilization and western values. And then I I contrasted with with um other societies out there and I asked you a question I said, you know, some people think that the alternative or the only alternative to western civilization is just a full-scale descent into barbarism. And while I can be sympathetic to that argument when it comes to the current trajectory that we're on, there are other societies out there. For example, look at China's civilization. Look at some of these East Asian civilizations like Japan, China, Korea. These are these are societies that have existed for thousands of years. They're not in, in a full-scale descent into barbarism. And so Nick and I were having a back-and-forth discussion about this and some of the differences between culture that exists in East Asian countries like China, like Japan, like Korea, yeah. and the culture that exists in the West. Because say whatever you want, uh, you know, for example, I, I don't, I mean, I'm not East Asian. I don't, I can't really say that I share their values, you know, through and through, but I can look at, at what they have in those countries and I can say, that's not a, that's not a full scale descent into barbarism, what they have in Japan or, or Korea. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's kind of telling that Asian Americans have the lowest, you know, infants well, being born out of wedlock. And, and so then I ask why? And I think part of the reason why is because in some of these East Asian cultures, there's there's two different types of individualism. There's an individualism that you and I support as liberty loving, conservative, you know, center right or right oriented people. I would not call myself center right. I'm definitely on the right. But but as liberty loving conservatives, there's a type of individualism that we support that is in line with the American tradition. And then there's another type of individualism that shouldn't even be called individualism. It's more of an atomization. And it's it's this idea that you you don't owe any sort of obligation, independent of the state and the yeah, law. Yeah. But from a cultural perspective, you don't owe any obligation to your family. You don't owe any obligation to your community. You don't owe any obligation to your your country, to your nation. That type of atomized individualism, I think, has been pushed on the West in the name of the liberty oriented individualism mm -hmm. that we support. And well, in doing so, it has torn down the social bonds that have led to the formation of things like families. Sorry, go. I mean, no, no. I, I, I think that's, I think that's true. It, again, if, if you, there is a, there is a line between liberty and licentiousness. L licentiousness is this idea that I, I don't, I, I don't, <laughs> you know. Again, this popular idea that I want to be able to do whatever I want, and I really don't care how it affects or impacts other people. And then there's people, then there's a line up from licentiousness where it's, I'm going to be, I'm going to do whatever I want. And, um, and I, and I do care how it impacts other people, but I have no obligation to get married and have a family, which is absolutely true. You do not have an obligation to do that. And then there's the Liberty, which says that I, I, I am not only looking toward my own experiences within this lifetime, I'm also looking to, to build a, a family and to take on the responsibilities associated with that. And the thing is, is that sometimes, and, and this is something that I, I sometimes get into, you know, problems with libertarians who I'm very good friends with, but it's this idea that, well, I, as long as you're doing it good and you're not hurting anyone else, all, all those things are equally good. No, they're not. They're not equally good. They may be equally um, um, permissible. And, and I don't mean the first one. Licentiousness is not permissible. Um, but, but no, I, I do think, I do think there is something noble about raising a family. Now there are some people that are unable to do that. And, and I'm not saying that they lack nobility or they lack honor or they lack purpose or meaning. I'm not suggesting that at all, but there is something about pouring in and investing to someone other than yourself. And, and that's important. And there's a number of ways to do that. Even ways that don't include raising your own family. But it's it's someone that says even if even if they don't believe they have a legal responsibility to to pour into society, they 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 receive benefit from doing so and they enjoy doing so and they enjoy bringing benefit and happiness to others and that is more noble than simply saying I'm going to go off and live by myself and I don't care what happens to the rest of the world it just is. But let, let's go into the let's go into this problem of what is what does this extent of fatherlessness mean? Like so you could say okay Nick great you've made a great case that you know, 80% of, of single mom or 80% of single parents raising kids are mothers, which, which means 
you know, again, this is largely about fatherless homes. And we already said there's two reasons why they're fatherless homes. I already had somebody in the chat be like, oh, let me guess. This is going to be another thing about bashing men. No, it's not. There are some men that are deadbeats. There are some men desperately trying to be a part of their children's lives and their ex won't let them be. Right. And we recognize both of those uh, situations. But here's the question. Somebody could look at all this and be like, yeah, so what? Who cares? Everyone's liberated. The problem is, is that you have this, you know, slavish devotion to the idea of the traditional family. And we need to be learning from, you know, the animal kingdom and dolphins. And like, like we don't need to raise kids as, you know, husband and wives. That's a, that's an archaic viewpoint. OK, let's look at the extent. Let's let's look at what happens with fatherness. So one more slide over here. This We already covered this. Go to the next one. Here are 36 statistics about fatherless homes. Go ahead and scroll down. Yep, just scroll down there. All right. Sorry. Statistics about fatherless homes. We're going to give you where all these come from. So here we go. Number one, 85% of youth who are currently in prison grew up in a fatherless home. Resources, Texas Department of Corrections. Number two, Seven out of every 10 youth that are housed in state-operated correctional facilities, including detention and residential treatment, come from a fatherless home, U.S. Department of Justice. Number three, 39% of students in the United States from the first grade to their senior year of high school do not have a father at home. Children without a father are four times more likely to be living in poverty than a child with a father, NPR. Children from fatherless homes are twice as likely to drop out from school before graduating than children who have a father in their lives, NPR. 24.7 million children in the United States live in a home where their biological father is not present. That equates to one in every three children in the United States not having access to their father. I'm going to stop here for a second. Um, for, the, for the stepfathers out there, Right, because this is, this is talking about biological fathers. All right, for the stepfathers up there that, that step up, um, and this is this is one of the things too that I, I wish Tina was here for because this is something that she can really speak to personally. Um, man, don't ever doubt the incredible impact you're having. I can um, speak to that. Yeah, I can speak to that because my my and, and I know that you want to keep going through it, but I just want to say oh, please, real quick yeah, that like, um, but I, I said earlier in the in the podcast when we were briefly talking about our introductions. Um, both my parents got remarried later on. I, in fact, I, <laughs> um, recently, like, a, well, well, about a month ago, month and a half ago, I was the best man at, uh, one of my best friend's weddings. Um, shout out to Tyler who there's two Tylers that we know. One Tyler I play video games with the other Tyler I've worked in politics with yeah. <laughs> the Tyler that I've worked in politics with shout out to you. Um, he just got married recently. Um, he's, he's got a, a an, an incredible wife now. And I was the best man at his wedding, but that was actually the second time in my life that I was the best man at a wedding. The first time was when I was five. In 1999, <laughs> yeah. I was technically, I was not the ring boy or anything like that. I was technically my father's best man at his wedding to my now stepmother, Carrie, who is, you know, the stories of like the, the evil stepmother. She's the exact opposite of that. Um, Carrie's a, a phenomenal, phenomenal stepmother. And, and I really, really appreciate having grown up with her almost, you know, ever since I was a little kid. And on my mother's side, my stepfather, Dale, really filled the void in ways that my dad physically couldn't because he wasn't around. Yeah. It wasn't that I, I I didn't... My dad and I have had a complicated relationship in the past, in part because we have such diametrically opposed political views. Um, very, very opposite political viewpoints. My dad's a college professor, so that could give you an idea. But... I will say this, I really respect his intellect, yes. even though I disagree with his with his philosophy. My love of history, for example, comes from my father. So there's a lot that I've idolized about my father in terms of of academic rigor. But I didn't I, I only got to see him, you know, when Christmas is or, yeah. or during the summer. I didn't get to see him on a day to day basis when I was like in school or, or just going about my life 60 percent of the year, 75 percent of the year. Dale, when he came along and he married my mother when I was like nine or 10, I can't remember exactly. I was at that wedding too. Um, but, but I had known him since I was like six. Um, it, it took him, I, I think like two or three years for him to marry my mother. And um, so I've known him for almost my whole life as well. Again, like 25 years almost. And he really stepped up and and filled that that void and uh, i i i really do give him a ton of credit for why i don't fall into any of these statistics that you're reading about right here because i i didn't have a father until 
again on a day to day basis until he came in and stepped up and like he showed me he showed me like how to shoot. He was a hunter. He still yeah. is. He, you know, he like like we would go on trips together. We would go hiking together. He he taught me you know everything I know about stuff outside of a textbook. My dad yeah. was great when it came to my love of history. And when it came to, you know, my, my pursuit of academic knowledge and becoming, you know, who I am intellectually. And Dale really gave me a lot of these practical skills that I think are critical. It's the second half of that when it comes to being a man. It's it's being capable physically and intellectually. Yeah. And Dale gave me a lot of practical wisdom. He still does. I, I really, really value him. And, and so, like... And, and and I know that Tina was in that same boat with with her stepfather. So like, I I really do think that that having good step parents is a huge reason why I didn't fall into you know I didn't end up as a statistic. Well, and, and another thing too, I want to I want to break to real quick because we got some more statistics to go through. Before we do that, I also want to show some appreciation for our sponsor, which is Good Ranchers. Um, for those of you who are looking for an, uh, maybe an excellent gift this time of year, or you're uh, just looking for just looking for a company that you can trust that actually shares some values and that also produces an excellent product, I'm going to highly encourage you go to check out Good Ranchers. If you use promo code Nick, you're going to get twenty five dollars off your order. You're going to get free shipping. And here's the other thing I want you to know, right? Just just go take after the show. Go or put it up in another tab yeah, in your window. Yeah, go look show. at go look at Good Ranchers and just look at the variety that they have between pork, poultry, beef, and wild caught seafood, right? There, there's just there's so many options that you can do. You can get locked into a price um, that that is gonna be inflation safe, you know, for what was it, two years? Two years, yep. Two years, inflation safe price that you can lock into right now if you get in one of their subscriptions. It's absolutely just a great, great package. And here's the other thing I'm gonna tell you. If you want it, some people want to support the show and we always tell them like, look, if you want to support, support the show, we really appreciate that. A great way for you to do that is to go get good ranchers, right? Use promo code, Nick, order some good ranchers, try it out. Tell us what you think. We've had people in the comments section before, like I'm, I'm enjoying good ranchers right now as I listen, which is an excellent use of your time, by the way, right? You're feeding both your body and your mind at the same time, all because of good ranchers. So promo code, Nick, right? $25 off the order, free shipping, Sign up for one of those subscriptions. You can lock yourself into some inflation, inflation-proof meat. Now, Nick, Nick, you did say that they could go get Good Ranchers, but Good Ranchers ships to it you. Ships it to you. Ships, I'm not it, ships it to you. Uh, yeah, that, uh, how convenient could it be? How much more convenient could they make it? So go on there, go on to Good Ranchers, check it out. Look at one of those packages that they offer. Right? Maybe maybe you dabble a little bit. Maybe you date Good Ranchers a little bit. Try, <laughs> check out one of those. Check out one of those patches before you sign up for the description to decide you want to you want to close the deal on this thing and get married. Right? You want to have a happy marriage with Good Ranchers. <laughs> All right, and tell them right. that we sent them with co promo yeah, code. Promo Nick, code right? Nick. Tell you tell you we sent them. Do we right. want to take questions? Yeah, we got a couple of questions. Forward. Let's go ahead and get to some of the questions here, and we'll get to some of these other statistics. Yep. We've got a question from Dan here. Do you feel that there has been a widespread decline in value of community at the local level that has contributed to a lack of support? in building families and encouraging their growth. Real quick, Nick, before we respond, I want to get to another question, if I can find it here, just real quick. Um, he, The gentleman said, oh, it was John. He said, what about the kids that don't even know who their father is? So let, let's start Let's start with, the, the, read the first question again. Yep, can do that. We'll That's why we do these one at a time there. Huh? I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Dan said, do you feel that there has been a widespread decline in value of of community at the local level that has contributed to a lack of support in building families and encouraging growth. Yeah, I, I do. And, and look, this is one thing Christian kind of hit on this too, as well. When we talk about this whole idea of individual liberty and individualism, right? We don't, we don't mean individualism completely separate from community. We simply mean that from a rights perspective, rights have to begin with the individual. Um, but that also means, you know, we, we should be one of the things that made America kind of unique within our culture. And Alexis de Tocqueville talks about this. And I, I've sometimes referred to it as a sense of rugged individual with a or a um, rugged individualism combined with a sense of community. And it, it used to be in like early American history. And, and you could even say, you know, not so distant American history 
when there was a problem to solve, people within a local community came together to solve the problem. And sometimes it required more permanent solutions. Sometimes it required temporary solutions, right? It could be all coming together to put out a fire. It could be um, all coming together to, you know, to set up a schoolhouse. Um, it could be helping each other when the harvest came in, right? Like all of these things were ways that you built community. And one of the things that was so important about it is because when you know that you you have your property, you have your place, you have your meaning and purpose within, within your own life, within your family, within your community, but then you also know that there's going to be times when you need to rely upon the other people within that community, from your church, from your locality, whatever it may be, it, it fosters this sense of just general politeness, right? It, it, fathers a, it fosters a sense of appreciation. When you try to replace that with a government program, here's what's so fascinating about this. And I don't think people, I don't, I don't think this is always understood by a lot of the politicians that, that maybe from a, a benevolent mindset are trying to push more government programs. When you remove the giver from the recipient, you don't actually build community you, you tear it down. And this, this seems kind of counterintuitive people, but uh, allow me to explain. When you know the person that is helping you, right? Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a member of your church, maybe it's just a member of the local community. Or when you know the person that is helping you, you are aware of the fact that A, they didn't have to, and B, they sacrificed something to help you. That creates, almost, uh, almost automatically creates a sense of gratitude and a desire to reciprocate. Because even if you can't reciprocate in that moment, you may never be able to pay back that person, but you know what it feels like to be in that situation and you have a desire to pay somebody back. And when you have a community that is built around that idea of voluntary cooperation and assistance in time of need, it builds gratitude and reciprocation. When you outsource that to a faceless government that just sends you a check, you have no idea who paid for it, you have no idea who, who had to make a sacrifice in order to help you, and the only gratitude you may feel is toward the politician that took it from somebody else and gave it to you. And it doesn't breed gratitude. It doesn't breed a sense of reciprocation. What it breeds is entitlement. And if you look at what's been happening within our communities, all of these government assistance programs have not created a greater sense of community. It's created, a, it's created an impulse in many of us to say, like, that's not my problem. That's why I pay taxes. And you know what? There's some degree of justification to that, that mindset, at least from a logical standpoint, because after all, they took it from you. And then, by the way, the same government programs that are administering all of this money and administering all of these programs, whether the program works or doesn't work doesn't matter because they're, they're gauging their metrics based off of how much money did they spend, how much people did they help. And we've removed the personal component of coming alongside and helping someone when they need it and receiving help when we need it. And when you take out that personal point, I'm sorry, but you rip out an element of the community that goes with it because you've replaced voluntarism with coercion and you've invited corruption into that process. And so I do think that a lot of the things that happen with our great society program under Lyndon Johnson and everything else in the massive welfare state, you, you, there may have been noble intentions associated with it, but I think when you look at basic human psychology and interaction and, and the absolute need we have to understand that we're not just getting a check to fill our needs, but that someone actually cared enough to do it, that is so important in building strong communities. That, that will stand the test of time, that will come through for one another in, in, in bad and dangerous and devastating circumstances. And we still have an element of that, but I think it's been, I think, I think it's been corrupted. I think it's been co-opted. And now when you tend to see it as, is more in situations where, um, you have a, a tight knit community, you still have a tight knit community. We see this a lot sometimes in rural communities. And, and I don't mean to suggest it can't happen in urban ones, but you see a lot of rural communities where they're coming together to help one another because, quite frankly, the resources, you, you can't wait for the resources to get there to assist. And so I, I think all of that's, um, so I think you're right. I think that's been heavily degraded, and I think we see the consequences of it. When it comes to kids that don't even know who their fathers are, we're, we're actually going to talk a little, we got a couple more things that are going to go for, and we're going to jump into that next because... Um, there, it is it is one thing to know who your father is and either not be able to have the access that you would like to them or to be denied that access because either the father or the mother doesn't want you to have it. And then there's just the complete unknown of where do I come from? And I think those impact people in different ways. And so we're going to talk about that uh, a little bit more here in just a moment. So I'm, I'm 
I'm not shirking your question. I'm just going to, I want to wait for a little bit longer in the, in the podcast. A couple more things we want to go to here. Um, number six, girls who live in fatherless homes have a hundred percent higher risk of suffering from obesity than girls who have their father present. Teen girls from fatherless homes are also four times more likely to become mothers before the age of 20. So this becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. When the father's not in the home, the daughter is more likely to have a child out of wedlock, which can, in many cases, once again, continue the cycle. Continue the cycle. 57% of fatherless homes in the United States involve African-American, black households, Hispanic households have a 31% fatherless rate, while Caucasian white households have a 20% fatherless rate. And these numbers have actually gone up a little bit since I think this was taken. In 2011, 44% of children in homes headed by a single mother were living in poverty. Just 12% of children in married couple families were living in poverty, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. You know what's also interesting about this and something Thomas Sowell likes to talk about, again, for the people that are, are saying a racist thing, when um, black kids growing up in two parent homes, first of all, uh, black families in committed uh, marriages uh, essentially perform at r roughly the same rate as, as white families and uh, kids, black kids growing up in two parent homes perform um, r roughly the same rate with respect to academics, um, you know, future economic prospects and, and things like that. So once, once again, it's this idea that, you know, it, I, I don't, I don't know that you can blame a horribly oppressive um, you know, culture in the United States for this, but when you have higher percentages of out of wedlock births and higher percentages of fatherless within the homes, that's going to have adverse effects. I don't care, regardless of what your race is. If, if you increase, if you increase these statistics with any other racial demographic, you're going to get similar results. And that's something that we should look at is both identifying the common denominator here and, and recognizing that no, it's it's not it's not because of systematic racism as much as it is some of these other these other things that are taking place. Um, number nine, children who live in a single parent home are more than two times more likely to commit suicide. 72% 72, 72 of Americans believe that a fatherless home is the most significant social problem and family problem that is facing our country. Only 68% of children will spend their entire childhood with an intact family. 75% of rape, rapists are motivated by displaced anger that is associated with feelings of abandonment that involves their father. Living in a fatherless home is, is a contributing factor to substance abuse with children from such homes accounting for 75% of adolescent patients being treated in substance abuse centers. 85% of all children who exhibit some type of behavioral disorder come from a fatherless home. 90% of the youth in the United States who decide to run away from home or become homeless for any reason originally come from a fatherless home. 63% of youth suicides involve a child who is living in a fatherless home when they made their final decision. Children who live in a single uh, parent or step family home report less schoolwork monitoring, less social supervision, and lower educational expectations than children who come from two parent homes. And the list goes on. The list goes on. So I hope what we've done in this first hour is made the case that this is not only has not only increased exponentially over the last several decades, but it is quite arguably the single largest... Go figure. The major problem facing our country right now it is is not Donald Trump. It's not white supremacy. It's it's fathers not being in the homes, and there's a, there's a variety of reasons for that. So here's what we're going to talk about now, and this is the the whole idea of finding male role models. So what if you are if you are a young man that finds themselves in this situation, if you're a, a single mom in this situation who is trying to do the best, right? Maybe you're the single mom that has the dad that doesn't want to be involved. Um, maybe you're the dad that's trying to be involved and, and is, and is having that pushback from you. We're, we're going to speak right now to those parents and, and those kids growing up in that, that circumstance. Like I said before, um, I, I was blessed to still have my dad in my life, just probably not as much as either one of us would have liked. And that was just, that was a, a side, um, that was a side effect of divorce. Um, for me, my grandparents were absolutely essential. Uh, in this role, absolutely essential. Um, like I already briefly mentioned before that my both my maternal grandfather and my paternal grandfather were um, just instrumental in, in my development growing up. They were both men that I looked at and that I admired and that took the time um, to, to be involved in my life. In addition to that, um, I, I had some people uh, with respect to church uh, life. Um, I, I had some coaches and, um, you know, two coaches in particular, and I'm going to call them out by name because they, they, <laughs> I don't know if they ever recognized the impact that they had, but, um, yeah, Mr. Nielsen and, uh, and Dr. Cleek, um, they, they both, they coached basketball. Um, and, and they, you know, they made sure that, you know, we, we got to our games and we got to practice and whatnot. And, um, 
and they they were just uh, very admirable, very admirable men, um, and and they were the sort of men that that you could trust um, to you know speak life into your your son. Uh, that they would, another thing that I appreciated about these men, right? They, they were not the sort of men to look at a young man in my situation and be like, oh, well, I guess you get a pass because things aren't ideal. No, no, they, they, they insisted that, that, that I perform on that team and that I pull my weight, right? And, and they didn't do it in a cruel way. They, they did it in a way that properly motivated a young man to want to strive to be better. Right. And they did it. They didn't just do it on the court. They didn't just do it in sports. They also wanted to make sure that you were fulfilling your roles and responsibility academically. And then the other thing that they were they were adamant about is they used sports as a way to illustrate some of the 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 conflicts and the struggles and the competition that you would face throughout life. And it wasn't good enough that you just show up and be good at the game. You had to be someone of integrity or you weren't playing for them. Right, you had to be you had to be someone that actually believed in 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 conducting yourself in an honorable way, because they would rather lose a basketball game than lose a young man to poor performance, poor behavior, or self destructive attributes. Right, and that's critical. That's critical because one of the things that you're you're going to notice about a lot of what we talk about, and and I've seen this. I a good friend of mine, Jim Charlton. He put a lot of time into youth coaching, a lot of time into youth coaching. And there was times where it took up a lot of his time, a lot of his time. And, and you could have said at any moment, like, you know, Jim, gosh, you got a lot to, I mean, you got your job and, 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 and you know, everything else. And he's like, Nick, this is a ministry, man. He goes, I, I see, I see too many, I see too many boys on my youth football team that <clears throat> the only time they see their dads is when they show up to the game and then they're yelling at them on the sidelines. Right. And that's it. Or, or they barely ever get to see their dads because mom is, doesn't even want them to come to the games, right? The, the, the mom is so adamant about keeping them away that the game is the one place they can come and actually see their son or try to be a part of their life. Um, they set up these groups within uh, the high school. And um, this is something, too, where, um, you know, my, my daughter's fiancé has also you know, been involved in this. We're trying to teach young men how to be good men, how to be gentlemen. And... You know, the, it's the sort of guys where he doesn't have to do this. It's not, it's not required in his job description. But because he's a counselor and he sees a need, he oftentimes steps and says, "Okay, how can I, how can I, how can I step into to a role that's required here, in order to make sure this young man doesn't go off the rails or go astray." And and it's basic stuff, teaching a teaching a, a young man how to tie a tie, right teaching them that it's important to open doors and be chivalrous, right? Which we're not supposed to do anymore. Okay, well, how do you like the world you're creating where you're teaching young men that it doesn't matter if they're chivalrous, doesn't matter if they show up? You know, that's one of the things that we need to keep in mind here. It's become really popular to bash men, but when you're raising men in an environment where they have no positive male role models because you've told them they don't need them, right? And you've told them that chivalry is dead, and you've told them that if they, if they naturally try to assume that role of protector and provider, well, then they're a sexist or they're archaic or they're believing in things that, that aren't relevant anymore. You happy with the results? So those men that actually step into those roles, they're, they're, they, sometimes they're pastors or youth pastors, sometimes they're coaches, sometimes they're grandparents, sometimes they're uncles or aunts, uh, or excuse me, uncles, I'm talking about the men's role right now. You know, that, that's critical. It's absolutely critical. Um, and and you will be shocked. This is the other thing too. It, it is when you when you run into a young man that has had such a deficit of that in their life, such a deficit of it. Man, you will be shocked at what just a couple drops of it will do for them, and the impact it will have on them. The the things that they will remember from that point where somebody called out, somebody believed that there was something good in them, but that they had to strive for it. Right? They didn't just come in and say, oh, you need to have better self-esteem. They said, no, there's something good in you, but you're going to have to work to define it. There's a talent in you. There's a capability in you. And that capability is going to be used for one thing or something else. The capability is there. The talent's there. The drive might be there. And it will be used. 
but are you going to foster it? Are you going to develop it toward the use of something that is good and noble or selfish and destructive? And sometimes it's that, it's that one season with that coach that cared enough to do something. It's that one season where somebody stepped in. So even if you think, man, I'm, I'm not going to be able to dedicate the next five years that fine, dedicate the next five minutes. If that's what you got, right? If you get invited to go and speak to one of these groups where they're trying to help these young men navigate a world that increasingly hates them just for being young men, then you take that time. You take that 30 minutes and you go and you talk to them and you give them some direction and you give them some hope and you tell them that those instincts that they have are not bad, they're not toxic, but they have to be developed and refined in a positive direction or they will go in a negative one. And so I, I would just say for, for the, the men out there, and for some of the boys who were just wondering, like, where, where do I find this? Where do I find this? I, I'm not going to tell you that there's one area that's just, you know, it's sports. Because the other thing, too, that I would tell mothers out there, because there's a lot of single mothers. And in fact, we have a, we have a, uh, a webpage up here where it's actually providing single mothers um, with places that they can go to potentially find, you know, men that can be positive male role models. And they talk about church. They talk about synagogue. They talk about... Uh, sports, they talk about, and, and those are all good. But here's the other thing that I, I want to make sure of: if if you're if you're the the good man in that young boy's life, um, you also want to protect him from the bad men. Because we we talk about this sometimes, like, well, what we, you know, when we talk about abuse for both girls and boys, and this episode is is largely di directed toward the men. It doesn't mean we won't do ones in the future directed toward daughters. But when you look at the areas of abuse, people are like, well, why does that happen with coaches? Why does it happen? Because they're going to the target rich environments. It's it's always the one like like, you know, the the child predators are usually the ones that they're not they're the, the, it's it's usually a myth that it's a complete stranger. Yeah. Right, that 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 picks up and preys. Not that it, it doesn't happen. It 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 does, but it's far more often somebody that they know. Rather than some, you know, complete stranger with the van that says free candy painted on it, right? Like, like, like that just doesn't happen. Um, I will say this, though, Nick. I, a question that I've got um, is, oh, and Grant's in the chat, by the way. <laughs> a, a question that I've got is, um, what do you do if you're, I mean, because I'm, I'm now old enough that, you know, I'm, I'm actually, you know, like, if I could find somebody, I'd love to, I'd love to get married and start a family of my own, but yeah. it wasn't that long ago. I'm still young enough that it, it wasn't that long ago when I wasn't the man, I was the boy. Yeah. And I think you've given a lot of really good advice on if you're old enough to fill the role of being a role model, here's how to go about doing it. What if you're looking for a role model? Yeah. I think there's a lot of, for example, uh, in Grant's uh, uh, um, question that he left us in circle, um, he pointed out, he's I, I think he's like 15, he pointed out that a lot of his friends in high school are, are listening to people like Andrew Tate right now. Yeah. Which is like something that Hamilton and I did not get to experience when we were in high school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we, Hamilton and I were in high school at the time when everybody, when the message was men suck, men suck, you're yeah. the problem, more patriarchy, yada, yeah. yada. It was the beginning of the Great Awakening, right? Yeah. But now we're at like the peak of the Great Awakening. We're probably not at the end. But well, we're, you're also seeing the response yes, to the Great Awakening. We're not and quite not at the, all responses are good. Are good. Yes. <laughs> we're not quite at the end, but we're, we might be at the end of the beginning of the Great Awakening. And like you said, not all re we're seeing a pushback against the Great Awakening. When Hamilton and I were in high school, there was no pushback. No. It was just getting started. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, I told Christian that if Andrew Tate had come, you know, five to ten years ago, it would have been too early. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, you needed to go through the clown world stuff that we're now going through for somebody like Andrew Tate to come along and get yeah. an audience that he has, but now he has one. And as you just pointed out, and that was a great point that not all responses, not all backlashes are going to be good. And we've talked about this before. We did a whole podcast contrasting and comparing Andrew Tate and Jordan Peterson. And we did point out, look, I I'm going to say it and it's kind of unpopular to say it. Andrew Tate does have a point on several things. That does not mean that I think he's the ideal role model. No. I, I would say he's probably right. 60 to 70% of the time, but that 30 to 40% that I disagree with are really strong disagreements. Yeah. I, and, and so Grant's point that he brought up is, you know, all of my friends are listening to somebody like Tate and I, I understand why, 
they're looking for this positive role model, and he's worried that they might be looking in the wrong place, especially when it comes to that thirty or forty percent there. Well, and this is this is something too that um, I want to answer that question. I also want to talk about kind of the role that mothers play on this because th- this is one of the things that I think is very very difficult for single mothers is that they're looking because their sons are going to look for a male role model, and the reason why Andrew Tate, Justin Waller, and some of these other guys are so you know, popular is because they're big dudes. They're physically capable, right? They can, they can win a fight, right? Um, they're highly successful, right? They have you know, beautiful women surrounding them, right? And, and so if you're, if you're a young man saying, you know, what do I want my life to look like? I sure as heck don't want it to, you know, go in the direct trajectory it's currently going. And they're saying, they're not telling all these, they're not telling all these kids. This is the part two that people need to understand. They're not just telling these kids, Hey, you're okay, buddy. Pick your, you know, you know, you're going to be all right. Like just, None no self esteem. No, stuff. they're not doing any of that. They're looking at those kids and being like, you need to go to the gym. You need to work out. You need to be formidable. You need to be powerful. You need to be intellectually. This is the 75% of things that they're saying that are very positive. And, and this just goes to show that if you're trying to raise your, your little boy by, Hey, Timmy, you're, you're just so, you're so special and wonderful. And, and I love you so much. And you're so smart. I, I'm sorry that that might work out well when they're three or four, but there's a certain age where they don't want that. They want to be, they want to be strong. They want to be formidable. And they look at Tate, they look at Wall, and they say, that guy's strong. That guy's formidable because in many respects they are. And some of the advice they give with respect to work out, be hard, you know, read, you know, play chess, like, old, that's not, there's nothing wrong with that advice. The problem is, is some of the other things that they talk about, especially with respect to relationship and women. That's the part where for me, it goes off the, it goes off the cliff and it goes off pretty dang quick. And, and that's the thing where young men now have access to this thing called social media, which is going to, it's going to offer them. It used to be that where were the options, right? Because if there was, if dad wasn't there and there wasn't a teacher and there wasn't a coach and there wasn't a grandpa, where do you go? Maybe you read books, right? Maybe you have a friend's dad that, that's a, that seems to be a pretty good dude. Well, now you just flip to your phone. You got a thousand options sitting in front of you. Not to mention the fact that you've got a thousand other options that will decay and degrade your sense of morality really quick. And when you're 15 it, or 14, it, when you're a teenager, yeah. it's not like you, and it's, it's not their, the, these kids fault because they're kids. They, yeah. they might not be able to identify sound wisdom from it's dopamine hit, dopamine hit, mm-hmm. dopamine hit, dopamine hit. And that's again, that's like handing crack to a 12 year old. Are you going to get mad at them when they get addicted? And, and that's, part of, that's part of the role that a father and a mother plays in protecting their children from things that they are not ready to experience. It's one of the reasons why I get so furious when I'm listening to all these people and politicians. Like, well, of course we need to have conversations with, about sex with third graders. Well, they're starting to go through development. Yeah, that's what I want. I, I, I want a I teacher I barely know to have intimate conversations with my child about sex because let's face it, sex education hasn't done a great job in preventing the things it's supposed to. Oh, and remember the fact, charts? <laughs> yeah, in fact, it's exposed kids to ideas and thoughts that they might not have been having at that particular time because sex ed is no longer Hey, here's the biological composition of your body and here's what it goes through for X, Y, and Z. No, no, no. Now they're starting to pique interest in all these other questions of sexual identity and sexual expression. The UN is talking about sex education, which also goes into the pleasure of it. Yeah. Wow. I bet that's going to achieve wonderful results for society. Let, let's, take a, let's take a whole bunch of hormonal teenagers right, that are already dealing with a bunch of things that they don't quite fully understand. And let's go in and add the pleasure component of all of that. With, with, again, teachers you barely know. Yeah, that, that sounds like, that doesn't sound like a recipe for disaster. It kind of went off, I kind of went off on a tangent there. This might be a, a good but, place. But, 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 the, but the, again, the, the, overall, the overall point of that is what, what, I would, what I would tell young men that maybe they don't have that positive male role model in their orbit, right? And again, the, the grandpa isn't there, the uncle isn't there, the teacher isn't there, the coach isn't there, um, you know, the friend's dad isn't there. There are places that that you again. There are places on the on the internet, and a lot of them are really bad. But not all of them are. And the question that you have to ask yourself as a young man is, what sort of man do you want to be? What sort of man do you want to emulate? Because I'm telling you right now, if if the sort of man you want to emulate is just, I want to be tall, I want to be physically strong, I want to be rich, and I want to have a lot of I want to have a lot of women around you. I I I get why that. I, I get why to a young man that might be appealing. I'm going to tell you right now, it is at the end of the day, it's hollow. And I and I will tell you that the. <laughs> 
I, I, think I can't Tr- choose to be tall, sadly. I, I think Tristan Tate. <laughs> I think Tristan Tate, and 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 um, I can't remember what Andrew Shade's status is on this. Tristan Tate has a daughter, mm-hmm. and um, I, I, I will I will tell you right now, um, there is something about having kids, and and I, I know people trash this a lot. Um, getting married uh, to a woman that you love and respect, and then having children. Um, when, when you kind of find out that, that nature, like what, what it is to love and respect that deeply um, and to have a mission for your life um, that, it, that is not just your professional dreams. And, and there's, there's nothing wrong with having professional dreams. There really isn't. But, but knowing when you say I do and knowing when you first hold your child that regardless of whatever else, ha- whatever else happens in life, you have meaning and you have purpose because you are in that moment, incredibly important to somebody. You are necessary to somebody. The drive that that gives you and the intensity and depth of affection and love that you will feel in that, I'm sorry, you're not replacing that with a Bugatti. You're just not. The thing that concerns me is, um, and I, I actually showed you this. There was um, there, there was this this random Twitter account that was out there and basically saying that like you know we we don't emulate you know we we lift up Jesus too much and we don't lift up Alexander the Great enough. Remember remember that? Yeah. I've noticed takes like that. Maybe not attacking the religion side, but just takes like that. You know, think of like Bronze Age pervert and stuff like yeah. that, right? Like we we need to emulate the the Greek warlord, right? We need to emulate the you know Julius Caesars and Alexander the Greats. And and don't get me wrong, as a as a history fan, as a classicist, is <laughs> yeah. like I don't think that there's there's I, I think there's actually a lot within masculinity that people like Caesar or Alexander the Great embodied that as men instinctively almost you look at that and you say how can you not admire the warrior component the courage under fire but this this trend towards what i i I would argue that this is actually the beginning of that descent into barbarism that we've talked about before because it's not sufficient to just be a warlord plato warned us about this in the republic Right, it's it's not enough to just be the warlord. The yeah. the ideal is actually the philosopher king. Yeah. Right. Like, I, and and I I pushed back in that Twitter thread. It was it was probably one of my most liked tweets ever, where I pointed out that like, yeah, that's all well and dandy. You can say that. Oh well, Alexander left his followers way more things than Jesus did. How many of Alexander's followers live to see the the fruits <laughs> of what he left behind? Yeah. And I pointed out that like list all of his family members, all of his friends, all of his confidants, every single one of them to a T, except for Ptolemy, were brutally murdered or killed in battle within a generation of him dying. Yeah, And and so like saying that that's the ideal, that's what's to go for, you just need to be strong, right? You just need to go out there and conquer, right? You know, go full Conan the Barbarian. You're going to be really unsatisfied when, if, if you go down that route and you don't develop any of that, any of the intellectual capabilities or you don't develop the moral compass, mm-hmm. just being a warlord for the sake of being a warlord is how you get a descent into barbarism. And guess what? You can go sack Rome all you want, but the <laughs> next morning when you wake up, you're going to be looking around and being like, what have I done? I, w- I would much rather you take Rome rather than sack it. And yeah. I think there's actually a difference between the two of <laughs> yeah. those. Yeah. No, I think that's true. We've got a couple of questions here, but there was this uh, comment from Shelly on YouTube that I wanted to read real quick because I think it's really good. She says, girls, girls used to pick their partners more carefully because that chance of pregnancy was there. He could be the father of my children. Um, pretty much the point she's making is we used to be better at picking. And, and what I think is interesting about this is like men used to have to live up to a standard in order to receive the benefits of marriage and having a family. And I, I think that women play a very important role in how men conduct themselves as well. No, that's well. The difference is so there's there's always a there's always female standards, right? And you can go watch you can go watch whatever podcast you can go watch. Today. No, no, there are there are. Oh. You could always watch. The, the this this is important. No, no, this is important distinguishing characteristic. You can go watch whatever podcast. You can go watch um, Fresh and Fit. I guarantee you, every woman out there has a standard. The question is, is, is it a standard for hooking up? Is it a standard for a one night stand? Is it a standard for, you know, whatever else, or is it a standard for someone that you want to raise kids with? What and the, and the problem is I, like, I, I understand, you know, the distinction. What, I, what I'm saying is, is that it's, it's standards never go away. It's not that bad. It's, it's actually worse. Standards become perverse. 
and perverse standards lead to horrible outcomes. And, and so, yeah, when, when there's the, when there's the prospect of, of having a child with somebody, you're going to be a little bit more selective. Is this somebody that's, that's going to be honorable? Is this someone that is going to stick by me? Is this somebody that's going to help me raise a child? And, and it, it is, again, it's kind of this perverse notion of, well, well then let's just take away the possibility of the child. Well, you can't, you can't take away the possibility of the child. All you can do is kill it. And when you start to go down that path, um, you create a general dehumanizing of people in general. There's, there's no way to get around that. I'm sorry. People want to come up with these distinctions like, oh, well, it, it, as long as it's inside the body. Well, if it's under two years old. Well, if it's, if it's going to have this disability. I, I'm sorry, but every line you just drew was after the point that they became a human being and an innocent one at that. And if you don't think that has implications for the rest of society, have you been paying attention? Let me, let me go into this. We need to go into this. We need to transition to this next point. And this is the, the role that mothers have in, in building men. Because there, there is understandably a great deal of emphasis on, on the role that fathers um, play and must play in this process. But sometimes I think we, we kind of skip over a little bit too much on what, what is the mother's role? Um, because, you know, I, I talked once about this idea of what's my role in, in helping my daughters grow into, um, you know, strong, intelligent, respectable women. Like my, my wife has the role of projecting that for them, for demonstrating that for them. But I also have a role in that. And mothers also have a role in developing their son and helping their, their boys develop into strong men. And and one of the ways I, I tried to explain that to somebody once is said, my son should be able to look to me uh, as a good protector and as a good provider. And what does that mean? Well, it, it, it means that I treat his mother with love and respect and admiration, both for her own sake, but also because it provides an example to both my daughters on how they should be treated by their husbands and my son for how he should be treating his wife. Right? So I'm, I'm providing, I'm providing those, those things that he is watching and he is inevitably analyzing for himself to determine, is this something that I want to replicate in my own home home one day? But my wife is the first person that my son ever also on some level got to protect or provide for, right? Because when she asks him when he's little, hey, can you, can you carry this for mommy? Or when he opens the door for his mom. Or when they're walking down the street and he gets on the side that the traffic is, right? Or when dad's gone and he's the one that makes sure the door's locked or he checks outside when something goes bump in the night. See, each one of those things that Tina's allowing him to do is calling out in him that idea of the protector, the provider. The other thing that, that I think Tina has done an excellent job for, and I will say that my mother, I think, did an excellent job for me on, is that my mom, and I, and I don't know how she knew, but she just did. She was keenly aware of the fact that there were certain things when, when you're a little boy that a mom does that makes a little boy feel special, it makes him feel safe, it makes him feel loved, Right. It's the, it's the going in there and like scooping him up and, and holding him when he's, you know, two or three or when he, when he falls down and he hurts himself and the mother's there with compassion. And, you know, again, mother can do a kiss and that's it. Everything's better all of a sudden. Right. Like the, the mother has this tremendous power in, in a young boy's life to make him feel safe, secure, and loved. But at a certain age, some of the things that a mom does that made the little boy feel safe, secure, and loved can make the young man feel weak and vulnerable. And, and it's, it is a difficult transition. It is a difficult transition. And, and again, I don't want to speak for women. I, I wish Tina was here today. I don't want to speak for, for mothers on this, but I did ask Tina about it. I'm like, what is, what is that like when you start to see that, you know, you're, you're not going to do the thing. He's too big now. You're not going to scoop him up and tickle him. You're not going to do certain things in, in front of his friends anymore. And she's like, you know, there, there's a part where it almost kind of makes you feel like you're unneeded, right? Or, or that, or that they've, they've grown up past you or whatnot. And, and you're, you're wondering like, you know, what is that? What, what's that going to mean for our relationship going forward? The part that I would encourage moms on, 
um, and, and single moms on as well, is that it's not that your little boy needs you any less. It's just they need something different now. They need something different now because you want them to be a good man. And, and and the nurturing that you pour into them is so important and it's so critical to that, but it, it's, it's going to change a little bit. And again, I, I think Tina has done an excellent job on this with, with Luke. I think I, I really appreciate what my mom did for me, where it was allowing me to, <laughs> to fall down and telling me to get back up. You know, it was no longer they scooping me up and be like, Oh, my, my, my sweet baby, are you okay? No, no, it was get up be strong because she not only knew I could be, she knew I had to be. And I, and I contrast that. I contrast that with, with the mom that will, when their, when their boy gets in a fight for the first time at school, right? 12, 13 years old gets in a fight for the first time. And it's like, I'm calling the principal and I'm calling their parents and I'm calling the, and, and I get it because the instinct is to protect your little boy. The problem is, your little boy doesn't want the bully to be afraid of the principal. Your little boy wants the, the bully to be afraid of him. Because one day there is no calling the principal. And I got called toxic for saying this. And, and all I was doing was trying to explain what a young boy goes through as they start to realize, oh, the world's dangerous and I'm going to have to deal with it. I'm going to have to contend with it. Nobody's going to call on my behalf. I want to be the one that they call. Well, that's toxic. Boys shouldn't be afraid of being weak or vulnerable. That's important. Boys should be emotionally mature. They should be tender to the people that they care about. They should be willing to accept a certain degree of vulnerability with the closest people in their lives. But no, boys should not be weak because men will be punished if they are. And one of the things that I really appreciated really appreciated about my mother on this is there were times I got in trouble for fighting, for acting out in other ways. She didn't accept self-destructive behavior out of me. It wasn't, Oh, my poor little boy wouldn't have done that. It was get your crap together because I know you can get your crap together because you need to get your crap together because people depend on you. And when she called that out, this idea that no, 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 I had, a, I had a mission. I had a noble mission, and it was going to be tough. It was going to be difficult, and she needed to help prepare me for that. And, and the first time that boy gets to experience that, you know, I'm protecting, I'm protecting mommy. That's the, first, that's, that's the first glimpse they get of it, right? And, and the mom gets to provide that, not the dad. The mom gets to provide that, and it's so critical. And when you embrace it, here's what you're going to find out. Like, I love my mother to death. Like, I I have a wonderful relationship with my mother. I cannot even tell you how much I respect her for not only, like, her her tenderness and her compassion, but her strength and determination. Right? My, My mother has always been a formidable woman without ever surrendering her tenderness. And that has just been, you know, again, as, as much credit as I give to my father for presenting you know, aspects of, of strength uh, and intensity and a willingness to defend and to face danger on behalf of those who needed somebody to be there. He was the one you called. He was a homicide detective. Before that, he, he worked a beat in LAPD in, in the most dangerous division they had out there. And anybody that ever worked with my dad or whatnot would tell you, your dad is the guy I want there when things go bad. I remember going into work with my dad once and um, there was this gang member that was on the bench. We're, we're in the station and I asked a question about one of his tattoos and he stops and he starts to explain it. And the guy looks up and he goes, look down. The guy went right back down and, and like just a glimpse. I mean, that's all it was. It was just a glimpse of the intensity I saw my father capable of. And what it was is I realized at that moment, oh man, I, I never, I never see that. I never see that. This guy does because this guy's a potential threat, but I don't see it. By the same token, my mom also built that idea and understood that I needed that. I needed to, to become the sort of man that a woman, a wife, a mother would feel secure and protected by. 
And so moms, just please do not think for a moment that there isn't a critical role that you play in this process. You do. And, and just like the role of the father can't be replaced, neither can your role. Neither can yours. And so I, I don't want to... <laughs> This is why this is why this dynamic of of the husband and the wife, the father and the mother. I, I don't care what you know, chic study comes out of Cal Berkeley. I, I don't care what sort of popular trend we see in Hollywood or anything else. You are not replacing that with some sort of artificial representation. As much as you can, provide that, but to the extent that that breaks down like it did in my own upbringing. It may be harder, but it's still possible. It shouldn't be sought after. It shouldn't be elevated. It, it shouldn't carry a, a higher sense of esteem or honor within society. But we can also show an appreciation for, okay, it didn't go exactly the way that was planned, but these two people still fought through, through bad odds in order to come out the other side with their kids intact. And so, again, for the things that I would tell moms is, yes, you want to seek out positive male role models. You need to know them well enough to know that they actually are positive male role models. You do need to be concerned because especially when your kids are younger, especially when they're the, the littlest and the most vulnerable, because there will be predators that seek out those positions of trust and that will seem just so helpful and so accommodating and so encouraging and there for you when you need them most. And I, and I know that sucks, right? It sucks that you have to try to distinguish between the predator that's doing that and the good guy that's doing that. But mom, at that point, if you're the single mom, it's one of the most important jobs you play in the development of your son. We actually did an entire episode on a predator actually explaining his method and he talked specifically about he would seek out single moms where the father had no role in the child's life, there was no positive male role model, and then he would go there and try to be the most helpful guy he possibly could for the mom to get access to the son. And so the only thing I would say is, yes, you got to seek out those positive male role models, but you're also going to have to be engaged enough. This is why this is not the way it was meant to be. It's because moms shouldn't have to go through this entire process to try to ensure that their kids are safe. The dad should be there to help as well. But if you find yourself in that situation where that's not a possibility, they need you there, but there are some there are some very good people out there that you will find and they usually end up being grandparents, uncles, sometimes it's the um sometimes it's the father um of a of a childhood friend. Um I remember another another um <laughs> another man that was really influential in me growing up was Dirk Ewing. Um man, I hope he sees this. <laughs> Because Eric Ewing was was is to this day one of one of my best friends. He's the the godfather for my uh, oldest daughter Lily. Best friends all throughout uh, school. Grow up, join the military together. Absolute great guy. Eric's one of those guys that I could. Eric and I haven't talked probably in two years now, and I could call him up right now and say, "Dude, I need you here tomorrow," and he'd figure out a way to be there. Um, but his dad and and his mom too, Renee Ewing, wonderful wonderful woman. But but Dirk Ewing was another one of those guys that. Um, you know, he was, he was my, my best friend's dad. And, um, he was also someone that he would, he would see capability. He would see talent. He would see a drive and he would work to call out the best part of it, but he would, he would accept no crap. Right? I, I think the closest I came to, to crying as a teenager was Dirk Ewing helping me and Eric with math one night. <laughs> but uh, again, there, there, so to, to the women out there, they're out there. The other thing I would say is that if you find yourself in a situation where you and your husband don't work out, but you know your husband's still a good father, he might not have been a good husband, but he's a good father. Um, the fact that my, my mom never talked down my dad to me. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Uh, it was quite the opposite. My, my mom would tell me that, no, your dad's a good man. Your dad's a good father. You need to respect him. He's someone you can look up to. And, and, and in a situation where um, you're growing up in that sort of environment, sometimes, especially if you're the parent that you spend the most time around, sometimes you almost feel like you need permission from them because it's so easy to, be, to feel like you're supposed to take a side in all of this. And when both parents give you permission to love the other, 
you end up loving both of them even more. You end up appreciating and respecting both of them even more. So there's a lot of power there. Don't feel, don't feel powerless. Don't feel hopeless. Um, those were, I think, the, the two main points um, I wanted to get through is kind of the, the role of, and, and, I, and I'll kind of close up with this and make sure that everybody else you know, that wants to say something or any questions that we have, we, we can get to those. But the, the last thing I'll just kind of leave you with on, on kind of the dialogue part of this, um, or I guess I should say the monologue <laughs> part of this, is um, the one thing you're not going to be able to escape, whether you're a, a father, a husband, or you're a, a young man watching this, is that you, you will have to take ownership of your own life. Uh, there's no getting around that. And there's, um, there's a lot of people right now that want to suggest that you don't have to as long as your circumstances were bad. Um, it's just not the case. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but whoever's telling you that is lying to you. And it, it might be a comforting lie in the moment, but it's not going to serve you well in the future. And for... I'll leave it with this. For the boys that are legitimately, not, not the situation I had, for, for the young men out there that are legitimately in a situation where the father's just not present at all and they are desperate to find um, positive role models, they're out there and you can find them. And sometimes you won't be able to interact with them the way you, you might want to, like with the coach or with the pastor or something like that, but they're out there. But for those that think that or are worried about what happens when they get married or when they have kids or, or something like this. And I say this because I have friends that have done this. Oh man. Don't ever think that because you were deprived of the father that you should have had, that you don't have a legacy to protect. You do. It's just going to start with you. You're going to be the guy. You're going to be the, the son that becomes the man, that becomes the husband, that becomes the father, that ends up changing the trajectory of an entire family because you refuse to let what happened to you happen to your kids. And it is, it is wonderful to have a, have a ready-made legacy to protect. I feel like I have that. I feel like my grandfather. I feel like my dad. I feel like my, my grandmother's my, my mom. I feel like they left me that. But if you don't have that, all that means is it starts with you, and there is something truly noble and special about being the first, the one that changed everything. And what a, what a noble thing to be able to look back on when it's your grandkids or your great-grandkids that know nothing of what you've experienced because you didn't let it happen. All right. Monologue complete. <laughs> we got any questions I still need to get to? Good monologue. <laughs> Christian, you got anything to wrap up with while I locate some more questions here? Um, you don't have any like off the, off the top. Um, there, <laughs> there was a few, there was like, there was a super chat from somebody that was pointed out, uh, that pointed out my condolences for anybody who likes pineapple on pizza. Um, <laughs> this is in reference to a joke I made, uh, yesterday, <laughs> it's a little bit more lighthearted, but a joke I made yesterday, my, um, <laughs> I, I came home and my kids had ordered a bunch of pizza and the only one left was pineapple pizza because it's horrible <laughs> and disgusting. Hamilton will eat it, unfortunately. And so I, I, I gave an apology to my son-in-law and ensured him that, or my future son-in-law and ensured him that I did not raise her this way. And it, it started a huge battle on Instagram on, on the efficacy of, you know, and, and it just goes to show sometimes the father is in the home and... <laughs> Horrible decisions are made. The kids still get, <laughs> still fail. You need to um on on April Fool. I've your your April Fool's reel next year needs to be that you are carrying legislation to criminalize pineapple on pizza. <laughs> that would be why make it an April Fool's. I, I, I will support <laughs> violating the non-aggression principle for people that that eat pineapple on pizza. <laughs> Hamilton over here is like anyway. Okay, so so all joking aside, um, I let me can I jump in? Yeah, here? Go, go ahead. Go ahead, so, Hamilton. I, I am the, the only person at the table that did have the benefit of growing up with two parents that stayed married. And I, I think that even there are a lot of people who, going off of what you're saying about legacy, there, there are a lot of folks who grew up with two parents in the household. But I think I've been very blessed to also grow up in a situation where 
I, I am also passionate about continually continuing the good things that they did mm-hmm. and in having, um, you know, being passionate about finding a wife that uh, we're committed to each other for the rest of our lives yeah. to going into that marriage with a willingness to make whatever sacrifices are necessary for my kid's education to be fruitful. Um, and I think one of the things, Nick, that I've admired the most about you and Tina is that you both were incredibly proactive in, in ensuring that you set your kids up for success, that you gave them the right mindset to have when it came to marriage. Um, you know, we talked about that with Lily while she was here on the podcast yeah. last week. Um, and so, you know, we've talked about folks who didn't grow up with a father, but I, I, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about, talk to the folks who do have kids, they are married, but what, what do they need to do to ensure that their kids have a passion towards continuing a good family situation, a strong marriage, strong relationships, fruitful relationships that continue that legacy. I mean, this is, people always get mad at me when I started off, I say, well, our faith was critical to that entire process, but I don't, I don't know what to tell you. That's the, if you're asking me what my experience was and what I believe to be true, that was a key component of it. Um, and, and part of that is because for, for Tina and I, our, our Christian faith provided an objective set of standards um, of morality um, that was above both of us, right? So when we talk about like me being the head of the household, it doesn't mean the tyrant of the household. I'm accountable. Um, it, it, and it means that we respect uh, the various roles that we play within that relationship. And what it did for our kids was it provided an incredible amount of stability. And some people look at that as like, well, that's just hierarchy and rules and the whole deal. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but reality has hierarchies and rules. Um, the, the question is, is are they benevol- benevolent ones? based on merit and honor and nobility and trust, or are they tyrannical ones based on uh, oppression and coercion and selfishness and greed? And w- what I found is, is that, um, and, and again, I, I can, my gosh, we could have several podcasts on all the things I wish I would have done differently as a parent, wish I would have done differently as a husband, the, the, the whole deal. But th- there was a certain foundation that always existed there, which provided that stability. Um, and, and it provided a standard, and this is an important part, it provided a standard to which all of us could appeal, right? If, if I, I may be, okay, so I'm the father, I'm the husband, I'm the head of the household. So people get offended by that, sorry. That means I had a great deal of responsibility to go along with that. And if I did something wrong, there was a standard to which everyone could appeal. And by that, I include my children. I, I've talked about this before. Where, where my children came to me and say, or my, uh, my oldest daughter specifically is a story I usually tell where she said, you know, dad, I don't think you handled this well. And she was right. And at that point I could say, well, I'm in, I'm in charge. I feed you. I clothe you. You know, what do you know? She was right. And so in that moment you have a choice. Are, are you going to say I'm a dictator? Do what I say. Or are you going to say you're right? I apologize. I was wrong. And I'm, I'm going to improve that. Can, can you explain why that distinction is so valuable. You've brought this up in previous podcasts, but I think it's actually been a while that distinction between I'm a dictator, do what I say yeah. versus no, th- this is right because it's right. Because if it, when, when parents, when parents tell their kids behave this way, because I say so. Right. And, and I'm not talking about your three-year-old running into traffic. I'm, I'm talking about your 16 year old. That's asking you an honest question about why something is a rule. If you never explain why it is a rule and you never explain this in a, in a logically consistent and sound fashion, if you never explain what the, what the overall reasoning for it is, then you haven't taught them um, how to think or, or even, you even haven't taught them what to believe about the particular issue. All you've taught them is to respect authority because there's a punishment and reward system for respecting authority. And I don't mean respecting authority in a, in a good and appropriate way. I mean in a, in a slavish response to reward or punishment. And, and there are some parents who, who I may agree with ideologically. I may agree with theologically. But if you've raised your kids in such a way where they're never allowed to ask honest questions within a safe space or, 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 or go through, you know, intellectually and, and emotionally dealing with some of these, these issues which form the crux of their worldview, 
And instead, what they've learned is I better regurgitate whatever mom and dad want to hear because I will be rewarded if I do and punished if I don't. Well, then what typically happens is they go off to another environment where guess what? You're not the ultimate authority anymore. The college professor is, the friend group is, the boss is. And what you really taught them was, was not, not a structure of beliefs and right and wrong and a variety of issues. What you taught them was do what you're told because you'll either be rewarded for doing it or punished if you don't. You taught them a slavish acceptance of authority over their lives. And you have not equipped them to be able to stand up to it when that authority is wrong. And so that's what I mean by the, the when, when you can admit to your wrong when you're chi- to your child, when, you've, when you have violated the standard that you taught them was a standard. Uh, and, and they come to you respectfully because that's still important. They still need to come to you respectfully. You're still an authority figure in their life. But when they do that and you admit that you're wrong and you humble yourself, not before them necessarily, but yeah, that's part of it, but you humble yourself before the standard, what you've told them is, oh, that standard is a standard because it's true. It's not a standard because somebody has the ability to impose it or to reward you for it. It's a standard because it's true. That's far more powerful in the long run. And that's what you need them to believe unless you never want your kids to be able to stand up to whatever the authority or status quo tells them to do. And quite frankly, we're, we're living in a world right now and I don't think it's going to get, I think it will get better, but I think it's going to get more difficult before it gets better. And we're going to need to raise more children that are willing to stand up and look at authority in the eye and say, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. And I'm not going along with it. And you can neither entice me nor threaten me to do so if it's false. This question is from Christian. He says, Nick, what? Not from me. Not, not from Christian. <laughs> Christian Burton. Different Christian. <laughs> uh, he says, Nick, what do you say to a man trying to navigate marriage? Two kids, financial burden, clown world. We're, we're all dealing with that. <laughs> and trying to be the right role model, struggling with vices. Asking for a friend. <laughs> well, so I, I would say that, look, I, I think um, most most husbands and fathers at some point in their life are, are struggling with all of these things. So the first thing I would tell you is don't feel as if, um, don't feel as if the reason why you're struggling with this stuff is because you, you just screwed something up or you're weaker than everybody else. And everybody else seems like they have crap together. Um, everybody's dealing with stuff. Everybody's dealing with stuff. The thing that I think that you choose, and can you go back up to the question? Yep. Clown world Thanks. affects us all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the thing that I would say, though, is here, here's what here's what I would do. Um, if you have things in your life, <clears throat> if you have things in your life that you know are problems, whether it be vices or whether it be, uh, like when we say financial burdens, there's some financial burdens that, that come upon us because it's just difficult to operate the fin- or navigate the financial world sometimes. There's others that are a result of, of poor decisions that we make. Some of it is about just doing an honest assessment and understanding that the vices don't get better with time and that work is going work and discipline is going to have to be taken to deal with things like vices, to deal with things with, with financial burdens and stuff like that. And that and that's a process. That that discipline is a process that you work through. Um one one of the things that I, I will say, and I don't claim to be an expert on this, so take this with a grain of salt. Um, I've always had a problem with with this philosophy that when somebody deals with a particular vice, that they're therefore an addict, as if that's now their identity. Um, I don't know why, but that's always bugged me. Um, there are things that there are things that either because of decisions we've made, sometimes because of decisions other people have made, that there may be predispositions. Some of them are genetic predispositions of things that you're more vulnerable to. But I would say never accept this idea that something you struggle with is therefore your identity. I don't think that's accurate and I don't think it's a healthy way of looking at things. Um, things can be conquered. Sometimes they have to be contended with, um, but they can be contended with. That's possible. And a lot of times people are seeking out motivation and, and motivation is a fine thing, but discipline's better. Discipline is what discipline is what allows you to get through it when you don't feel motivated to do it. And part of it is, is part of it. And again, I think this is important for men when we do have a wife, when we do have children that we, that we love and we know we're responsible for, it sometimes entices us to, to get up and do what needs to be done when everything else tells us to just go back and lay down. Um, so understand that you, you do have a noble mission uh, in your marriage. You do have a noble mission with your children. And part of what this also does is sometimes you also have to look at the people around you. Are, are the people around you rooting for you? And I don't mean rooting for you and just like, Giving giving one hundred percent approval of every single decision you know you make, but are actually holding you accountable when you make bad ones. 
you know, one, one of my best friends, you know, Nate, <laughs> he's, he's the guy that he will hold me accountable. He wants me to be successful. Me being successful doesn't mean giving carte blanche to every decision I make. And, and, and we're close enough to where if I've done something wrong, he'll tell me. And he's not telling me because he's being a punk. He's telling me because he knows I need to be better. And I can do the same thing for him. Because, again, he doesn't, he, he doesn't want to just, you know, and, and this is important to have people like this in your life. They don't want to just preserve a comfortable friendship. They want to be iron sharpening iron. They want to they make you a better, they want to help be a part of the process for you being a better man, being a better husband, being a better father, right? Surround yourself with the sort of people that share that sort of worldview and are willing to do that and are willing to do it in a way that's also respectful to you. They don't, they don't talk you down. They don't embarrass you in front of other people, but they will take you aside and they'll be like, hey man, I, I got to tell you something. And, and you know it's because they want the best for you. That, that is such a critical part of doing this. And the other thing, too, is, again, I'm a Christian, so I'm going to give you Christian advice. All right, Making sure that your, your, your walk with Christ is strong is, is absolutely essential. Um, for those of you who don't believe that, I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, all I can say is that it's, it's always been, there's never been a moment in my life where it hasn't been true and that I haven't seen the, the fruits of that once I've, I've res- responded appropriately. I got a question here from Torino that he had proposed earlier in the stream. He says, "Do you think having a positive ha- having positive father figures in media is just as important? For example, for example, Optimus Prime and Uncle Phil from The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Those characters had an impact on many." No, I, I do, I, I do. Look, there, there's a there's a reason why uh, the arts and entertainment is so powerful with respect to shaping culture. Um, if you look, go look at the most powerful political leader in the world right now, right? Joe Biden. That dude doesn't have a fraction of the followers that the Kardashians do. That dude doesn't have a fraction of the followers that Ronaldo does, right? There's not a single powerful politician in the world that can hold a candle to the people within the arts and entertainment area. And so when our art reflects, and this is sometimes too where, where people will bash old movies or old sitcoms or whatnot is like, Oh, well that was never, that was never a true representation of what was actually going on. Well, okay. It's yeah, it's, it's entertainment. Guess what? The crap you're doing now is not necessarily a full, um, you know, imitation of what's going on. But the reality is, is that one of the things that arts and entertainment has the ability to do is, is, is hold up a positive ideal as something to strive for. It also has the ability to hold up the wrong sort of ideal, which can cause chaos and disintegration of society. And so, no, I, I don't, I don't think, I, I think what you're talking about, it actually has a great deal of relevance. And, and one of the things I'm, I'm encouraged to see is, is various studios and, and some directors and some actors who get that and, and are actually looking to make the sort of, the sort of uh, movies or the sort of entertainment or sort of uh, series is that, that do uplift the role of fathers within the whole, that don't treat every father like he's, you know, Homer Simpson or, or, um, you know, what is it? Griffith and uh, not Andy Griffith, but the other Griffith and, and you know, family guy. But it's that whole idea of like degrading the father is just a bumbling moron and idiot. The, um, the, the flanderization of, of fathers and a lot of these sitcoms have, uh, have, have gotten so bad. If you actually watch like the first season of the Simpsons, like, like the really early episodes, Homer is not the bumbling idiot that he ends up becoming. Yeah. And, and it, it's not a unique thing. Like it's happened everywhere within the media over the last 20 years, men, especially fathers are portrayed as idiots who have no, who, who are just, you know, they're, they're, they're used for, for the laughs, right? It's, it's just a, a, a gag. And, I actually think, in, in retrospect, that has been in- incredibly destructive. Oh, yeah, it has been. I, I want to jump in because I am the DJ.net proposed question that goes right along with this. So I want to get it in here. He said, does Hollywood bear the responsibility of degrading fathers, seeing Homer Simpson like fathers being disrespected by kids, spouses, etc.? Yeah. 
is a sad, degrading portrayal of what men are. I, I think that, well, there's two parts of this. One, um, they bear a portion of the responsibility because they put it out there, but everyone that watched it also bears part of the responsibility because Hollywood ultimately is responding to their customer base. Yeah. And that's that's not that Hollywood doesn't try to shape their customer base. We, we see that a lot, but one of the reasons why there's such a rebellion against Hollywood right now, if you've ever listened to like Nerdrotic or some of the other shows out there on YouTube, they, they're doing an excellent job critiquing Hollywood because Hollywood has gotten too much in the business of telling us what we're supposed to think. And people are starting to reject it now and that is a positive thing uh, because we do have the ability to impact the sort of entertainment that we have but it, if it, it's up to us to view the right things i have gotten to the point here if there's one thing that's really good about streaming and one thing that i've really learned about social media and youtube is like we will go through and we'll, we'll look at the content that we do and we'll look at okay where where are viewers checking in what had the greatest impact where are they checking out where, where did we lose them I guarantee you all the streaming services are collecting oh, yeah. data like nobody's business. And I've gotten to the point now where when I watch a movie or I watch a series and all of a sudden they go down a road that I think is destructive and wrong, I stop right there because I want to I want them to look at the analytics and know that I didn't watch to the end. I want them to know where they lost me. They lost me the moment they did that. And and so I, I think that's I think that's powerful. I, I also think, look. Um, one of the things that we did with our kids, right, and we homeschooled, um, we never had cable. Now, we had internet, but we never had cable. Um, and so we actually had a lot more control over, you know, kind of what took place. Um, but when they were really little, we bought like the, and this is when we were, people were still using DVDs more, we bought like the, the whole pack of I Love Lucy, Andy Griffith Show, or not Andy Griffith, A Little House on the Prairie. We would watch the BBC adaptations of Jane Austen, you know, uh, novels, and I've, I've talked about this a little bit. We would watch Gilligan's Island and stuff like that. And what was fascinating is to our kids, right, they didn't, they didn't look at it as, oh, I'm missing out on all these other shows that my friends are talking about. They got to watch those shows with us. And what ended up happening is we had reference points with our children that they didn't have with anybody else. Yeah. And, and, and they thought it was hysterical. They loved I Love Lucy. They loved, um, you know, Little House on the Prairie. And, and it's not that every, you know, portrayal in those is, is wonderful and great, but it's, it's a, a dang sight far better than what you get in, in, yeah. in most things today. And again, they didn't feel like they were missing out. They got to watch something that was that was funny, that was age appropriate, that that dealt with issues. My gosh, Little House on the Prairie deals with some real tough issues. Um, and and it's not that you know the dads were strong, so the moms could be weak. The mothers in incredibly strong in Little House on the Prairie, and they had to deal with issues. And sometimes the dad had to be reined in, and sometimes the dad had to step up. And, and so anyways, I would just say that, yeah, entertainment does play a role, which is why we should be really careful of what we put in front of our kids. Yeah. I grew up watching I Love Lucy, and my grandfather and I would uh, go to our mountain house and watch. He had a whole collection of John Wayne movies on VHS. We would yeah. just watch one after another. Oh, yeah. Great times. Uh, we've got three super chats I want to get to here, and maybe we'll try and keep today's episode under two hours for once. Uh, this one's from Isaac. He sent it earlier in the show. He said, toxic masculinity is a poor term. There are only poor fathers, men who lack self-control, and good men who want to be fathers. I, I think, you know, we, we did a whole episode on the whole idea of toxic masculinity and toxic femininity. And and one of what, what we were trying to do on that is we were actually trying to have an honest assessment of what do we mean by this toxic component. And what we broke it down into is this. There are certain traits associated with masculinity. There are certain traits associated with femininity. Um, and, and they're, they're to, you know, different people display these traits to varying degrees. But what we came up with is, and, and I, and I think this is, I think, <laughs> I think it's accurate. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll use a, I'll use a, um, I'll use a, a masculine trait and a feminine trait. So a masculine trait is, um, competitiveness. If competitiveness manifests itself in cheating so you can win. That's a negative manifestation. You want to call it toxic? Fine, call it toxic. If it manifests itself in constantly working and striving to be better so that you can effectively compete in a way that's beneficial, then it's a positive manifestation. So ultimately, it's not that, the, it's not that masculinity is, is this or that. That particular masculine trait can have a positive manifestation or a negative manifestation. When it, when it comes to femininity, we, we sometimes talk about feminine traits with um, things like being uh, empathetic. Well, well, being empathetic 
a, a positive manifestation of empathy is that when somebody genuinely needs you, you're actually able to truly, um, you know, it helps because of your ability to, to truly commiserate with them. You can help them na- you can help navigate them out of a dark place. A negative manifestation of empathy is that you can also create codependent relationships where, where now you're, you're seeking out and, and going even deeper into the hole because it makes you feel it's almost like this much housing by proxy where it, it makes you feel, you know, strong and needed when that person needs you. And so rather than helping them cr- climb out of it, you walk them deeper down the, the, the tunnel. So is that toxic femininity? Well, it's, it's a trait that has a toxic manifestation. And, and unfortunately, what, what happened with the whole toxic masculinity discussion is, is people started off with something that might have had an element of truth, and then they tried to uh, plaster it all over masculine traits as if they were somehow inherently toxic, and what we really needed was men that were more feminine. Well, guess what? You know who really hates, you know who really hates that, it turns out, in the dating market? Liberal women. Turns out liberal women don't like overly feminized men. Also turns out that liberal women, especially liberal single women, are the <laughs> I I, Be I nice, mentioned this Christian. before. Yeah. I mentioned this before in a in, in a um in a tweet. There was there's some there's some people on the right, I will not name them. There are some some women on the right who have repeatedly spent a lot of time attacking men lately. And finally, a lot of people kind of snapped and and you know, ratioed a lot of these people. And and one of the comments that I made was why on earth are we spending most of our time attacking men when the problem is not married men? The problem is not married women. The problem is not even single men. The problem is single unmarried women or the, out of the four groups of people, you can only be one of four. Sorry to the people that believe that, you know, gender is, is a, uh, is a spectrum, but you can only be Married or unmarried, and you can only be a man or a woman. I know that last one's a bit controversial nowadays, but <laughs> um, out of those four groups, there's only one group that has consistently given an absolute majority, like 60, 70 percent of their votes to Democrats, to the left, and they've outvoted the other three groups, and it's single women. And yet there's there's this constant element, and you know this, Nick, there's this constant element of people on the right that want to spend their time attacking single men or even married men for that matter, and completely, like, like we're just supposed to give a pass. Like, th- these people have no accountability. They're completely independent and free of their own actions. Well, and I, I, you're, you're getting this backlash where people are like, no, you don't get a pass. The, pe- the one group of people that are consistently voting for the left and then turn around and say, well, I have standards and I, I'm looking for a traditional conservative man who doesn't hold any sort of traditional conservative values... <laughs> I'm sorry, but people are sick and tired of that type of hypocrisy, well, especially I, I when think, they're the ones voting to make the problem. I, I think you are seeing that. I think you are seeing that backlash uh, taking place. The, the problem is, is that within conservative movements, the reason why it's so easy to, you know, basically call men to be better is because typically, if you look at the way, if you generally speaking, if you look at the way women motivate versus the way men motivate, women are typically motivated by a a sense of of community and we're all in this together and you go girl and the whole deal. Men are usually motivated by get off your butt and go do something. Right. And, and part of it's just the the way that we're driven. The, The problem is, is when that ends up being something where men feel like they're being trashed all day long for stuff that they either can't control or stuff that they never did. And, and they're just guilty by proxy. Um, and then they're being told by the side that is supposed to be, you know, at least ostensibly on their side that, yeah, you need to like, and like, no, I'm done. I'm done hearing it. I'm done hearing it. And so the, the problem, the, the goal for conservative men should not be to say, to not be to jump on the bandwagon and say, yeah, men suck. The goal should be for conservative men to come alongside men and say, I know it sucks, but if you if if the fact that this sucks, if you let that make you suck as well, it's not going to make anything better. And 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 the empowering part of this message is is that it, it it may be unjust, but you have an opportunity to change it because honestly, the way that you conduct yourself in difficult times has the biggest effect on what future times will look like. And if and, but if if you are waiting for everyone else to correct so that you can be appreciated for all of those attributes, it won't happen. That that's why they talk about. Hard men making good times is because they chose to be good despite the circumstances. And, and again, we can say that's unjust, but it's also the thing that ends up 
saving us. We already referenced this super chat from Sir Grog. Yeah, we got another one. Uh, this one from Elise. Uh, she says, what are your thoughts on the family, a proclamation to the world by the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints? Um, I'm, I'm not... Uh I'm not a Mormon. I don't agree with the theology of, of the Church of uh, Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, or, or, or more commonly known as Mormons. Um, I, I, I will say that uh, Mormons put an incredibly strong emphasis on on the family um, and on the roles with the family, and, and you do see a, a lot of families that are, are very strong with within the Mormon Church. And I, I think it, I think it does go to show that there's certain principles that apply. And, and I can disagree with you theologically. And if you apply certain principles, um, you're still going to see positive results. But I, I you know, a, again, not, <laughs> um, not, not, look, when it comes to theology, I'm, I'm very partisan. <laughs> right? Yeah. And 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 I and I think uh, I. I think I think, look, everybody's capable of applying good principles and, and seeing success with them. Um, the question for me is always going to come back to what is the ultimate foundation of the principles? Because at the time of testing, that's that's really what's going to determine, I think, what what stays and what goes. Um, but I, I haven't read it, so I, I can't speak with, with any more intelligence than, uh, <laughs> than that. This last super chat comes from Talk Farms, and I'd like to respond to this first, Nick. Sure. Uh, former Marine here, blessed enough to move back to the family farm to raise my four kids. How much do you think the environment we've raised our kids plays a role? My kids got deer with me, go pheasant hunting, and the 10-year-old is driving vehicles. Well, let me say, one of my best memories was uh, like leaving at 3.30 in the morning, driving to the mountains with my uncle, and, uh, you know, hiking up a mountain, getting a deer, coming down. Uh, we were hunting in the morning. We were hunting in the afternoon, and we had taken a deer in the morning, and we put the deer right in the creek, gutted it all up, and I'll never forget that memory. And then as probably a 10, 11, 12-year-old, I took great pride in being able to back a trailer. <laughs> I took great pride in that. Um, yeah. And, I, I, you know, my grandfather provided, you know, all types of opportunities for us, to, my brother and I, to go hunting, and I, I think that it was incredibly beneficial. I, I, I will say that, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, the, the environment is critical. And, and this is, if there was one issue that I, um, that I kind of have just in general with people that say are more like-minded to us is that <clears throat> I, I don't think they put enough emphasis on the total environment for their kids, especially during formative years. Um, if you're constantly competing with other environments, which are telling your kids something the complete opposite of what you believe, that's difficult to navigate. It's not impossible. And there's situations where it's not avoidable. There, there's situations where it's very difficult to avoid. Sometimes you, you find yourself in an environment where for financial reasons or whatever else, there, there's certain things that, I mean, it just is what it is. Uh, but it's important to recognize that, okay, if you can't protect your kids from certain environments or the totality of certain environments, then you're have to get, you're going to have to make it up somewhere else in, in that relationship. Um, you're going to have to be very, very proactive in combating some of the things that their ideas or whatnot that they're going to be exposed to uh, in order to make sure that they, they – and, and look, to some degree, you can't protect your kids from everything. And, and really what it is, it's more about what are the age appropriate times to um, expose your kids to different ideas, different concepts, so that you can uh, develop them into good critical thinkers that have a good moral basis. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we emphasize a lot is that, you know, if, if your kid's faith is just, if your kid's faith is really your faith that they're borrowing, it, it's not going to mean much when, when you're not the primary role model. And so making sure that you have, uh, making sure that you have kids that are spiritually, emotionally, uh, physically, um, intellectually, and I would say professionally prepared, uh, to go out, to go out into the, into the world and, um, and, 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 and really find their meaning, find their purpose and then fulfill it, uh, is actually critical. And environment is a huge component of that. And, and so I, I always try to encourage parents. It's like, look, I'm not saying don't expose your kids to challenges. In fact, I think you should actively um, expose your kids to challenges um, that are age appropriate and will help them overcome something and not just pick them up and solve it for them. Uh, by the same token, though, just un understand, protect your kids from those environments for which <laughs> the way I worded it once is, is this. As a parent, you got to let your kids get bruises sometimes but you want to try to prevent the scars. So yeah, that's what I'll say on that. I agree. All right. Well, listen, I want to thank everybody for hanging in. We've been at this for about two hours, but I, I think I, I really want to thank all the questions we got the, yeah. the insight. Um, quick, 
quick note to our audio listeners. Um, if you ever hear me at the end of an episode kind of rushing us through, kind of pushing us through, it's because I'm trying my best to get the audio edited and get it uploaded on the audio platforms so that when it hits 3 p.m. Eastern, it's ready for you. And so if we're ever, you know, 315, 320, getting the audio out and publish it's because we went a little bit longer and we're having to take that time in post-production to get it up. Uh, but I'm not rushing us because I want to end the conversation. I want to make sure everybody on audio that's waiting for the episode to drop uh, doesn't have to wait. Don't you ever interrupt me again. Okay. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Appleton. I appreciate that. And again, appreciate our audio listeners as well. And uh, everybody that's that's chimed in, that's comment. Again, if you're if you're interested in helping uh, shaping the direction of the show with respect to the topics that we address, um, again, today's show, I, I you know, um, this, this came from our chant, like Grant and uh, Jonam were, were the people that inspired this. I really appreciate it. They didn't just come in and say, Hey, can you do something on this? They really took some time and, and, and uh, helping us kind of look at what an outline would be. Some of the questions that we need to address. Hopefully we did a pretty good job of that, but I really appreciate it. So there's uh, notes in there. Also, once again, a uh, huge thank you to Good Ranchers. Yep. Um, part of the reason why we're able to, to to continue to do this and hopefully expand. We've actually got some yeah. really exciting ideas that we want to talk to you guys about kind of going into 2024. Uh, we think that's going to potentially be a big year because of you guys. We've we've grown quite a bit over the last several months. And uh, we, we think that should translate into some other projects and some other things that we provide for our audience. And uh, you buying stuff from Good Ranchers, uh, you putting Good Ranchers on your table uh, helps the show out a lot. So that's just one more reason to get some excellent poultry, pork, beef, and wild caught seafood. It's manly. A good steak is wild, a good and, steak. And wild caught seafood. You do the surf and turf, and then take the turf and wrap it in bacon. Never thought about that. Always. All right. Once again, thank you very much for joining us, and we will see you next episode. I was...